Hey, welcome to my Instagram live featuring this beautiful voice you hear in the background. Have any of you ever had a pen pal? Do you remember back in the day when you were at school and your teacher said to you, we're going to do pen pals now and we're all going to write to a, a random person somewhere else in the world or in your country in a different state. And you didn't know that person, but you wrote to each other and you formed a friendship over writing letters back in the day. I'm talking way back. <laughs> well, I formed a cyber pen pal with a wonderful coloratura soprano from the United States of America. And you can hear her singing here in the background. I'm gonna go live with her in just a second and do a huge introduction. So my dear friends around the world, while I try to hook her into this Instagram live chat, please make welcome a new cyber pen pal friend. It's Megan Vigeno! beautiful voice oh we think of me <laughs> how are you oh my gosh i'm i'm well you know i'm i'm covid good i'm covid doing okay how, how are you doing i think i'm the same except yeah. i had something very exciting happen on the weekend i had my first concert back after eight months oh how did it oh. feel I know, just that feeling to stand on stage again was thrilling and exciting. I was pretty nervous to start off with, but then it all just sort of flowed again. It's like riding a bike, isn't it? You just oh. get straight back in there again. And it was really exciting to perform for a live audience again. Um, but yeah, absolutely. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm back in New York. I just got in like last week. So hello from the Big Apple. As you can tell, I've got my black on. I'm already up. <laughs> Yes. I've got my pillow for you. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh, I'm so happy that you had a live performance. Like honestly, I I kind of forget what it's like. Well, I don't. I dream about it, but I like even like the the tingles and the excitement. Like I can't wait to have that. I'm so excited for that. Like oh, how did it happen? Did it, was it good? It was. It was lots of fun, and um, I sang a lot of really classical repertoire, which was really exciting um because i did it just a piano vocal recital so it was a little bit more classical but it was really really fun and um and just yeah a thrill to stand on stage but we're here to talk about you today megan and also something that's really important to us an mm. important um message that we want to get across and we want to talk about but let's just start about you so you grew up where um, so I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. So I grew up a Midwestern girl, but very Chicago is its own own thing. So Chicago uh, is where I, a suburb of Chicago is where I grew up, and then um, moved to well, my parents moved to New Jersey, and then I became a New Yorker actually, because then I, I fell in love with New York, of course, and then I was like, and this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. And then you went to the Manhattan School of Music and you did a Master of Music. Yep. So I got my Master's uh, there in uh, vocal performance opera because I was full-fledged opera. Although like my, I always liked music theater, but that's where, of course, I started. Like you, I'm a crossover artist. So uh, do, I do this a lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's talk about that because how, when you were growing up as a child, and you were singing, did you ever imagine that you'd become an opera singer? Well, as a child, I was not singing, actually. I was playing piano. I, oh. I was not one of those people that knew um, from birth that I wanted to do even music, honestly, as a profession. I mean, it was always going on in my household. Like, my dad always had, like, symphonies on, and, like, obviously, like, you know, the oldies and everything were on, but I didn't grow up in a household that was, like, music theater, opera. I mean, in fact, the first opera I ever saw in my life was my junior year of high school uh, in French class. And we went to see it. And that's actually when I first was like, whoa, opera, what is this? This is pretty yeah. cool. And, um, and the, only, the only music theater show I ever saw growing up, only one was Les Mis, actually, 
which P.S. I've told this before in interviews, but this is this is batting. Like this is really like meant to be. We I found out just like a couple years ago. Well, last year for one, and then two before that. That very production that the one music theater show I saw my whole life yeah. growing up. The music director was you know, well. The conductor was my conductor for Love Never Dies. And the music director was my conductor for Phantom of the Opera on the world tour. How crazy is that? Meant to be. Meant, Meant to, to be. be. So that's honestly, like, again, like, I didn't, like, I did, like, a musical year in high school. Like, my freshman year of high school, um, I auditioned more just, like, for fun. And I got the lead. I was Marion. That was my first show. Marion the Librarian in, um... <laughs> in the music man and then yeah subsequently like we would do like a show a year but like also then like you know i'm doing like cheerleading and tennis and national honor society like it wasn't like this is the only thing i'm gonna do but then my my senior year i auditioned for our all-state theater and they were doing pirates of penzance and i i got the lead as mabel and so that was my first time also so like i saw my first opera junior year my senior year then i was cast in my operata uh, not mine, <laughs> not mine. Um, uh, and, um, and then, yeah, kind of, it just sort of was like, oh, I, I kind of like music, like maybe more than just like a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad that you thought so. Could you imagine Me too. <laughs> you have thought in a different direction? Um, you start, then you started doing opera and you, you started in um, your biggest production from graduation was, of course, Candide, which you did with the New York City Opera. Can you tell us how it felt to be on that large stage, going from perhaps that feeling of, I don't know if this is what I want to do, but let's give it a shot, to then suddenly standing there and, and doing such a huge production? Yeah, well, that was just so crazy. That was also one of those meant to be mo um, just meant to be moments, you know, um, because actually I was singing opera in Spain and then I flew back and that's when, well, that's a long story. Well, I've said that story a billion times, honestly, about how I even got the audition. It, again, it's one of those, just like, I know those moments happen to you too. It just was so meant to be. Yes. But, right. but, but the cool thing about this Candide was it wasn't full on opera because I've done that kind of yeah. Candide too, right? Because Candide is one of those fascinating blends of, is it an opera? Is it music theater? Is it... Uh, operetta it's all it's all three quite frankly but mm -hmm. this one so Hal Prince was the one that did the original Candide and here he was back doing a revival of it and he said that this time he got it right it was his best production he ever did and it was literally I remember it was kind of like all the Harry Potter houses coming together because it was like <laughs> the Broadway people the ballet people the <laughs> opera people and like it was one of those magical casts like that never happened, right? They're just once in a blue moon. And we all know those kind of casts. Like, we're still friends. We have a little chat group that we still three years later are like, oh, oh hi. <laughs> but it was just one of those magical casts. And like, by Broadway people, I mean, like, Tony Award women. I mean, you had Chip Zine, Greg Edelman, J. Armstrong Johnson, Linda Lavin, um, Brooks Ashmanskis. I mean, like, it was just like mind blowing. And then, awesome. you know, so I just, I remember sort of being because they ran it more like a Broadway show, not an opera, which also yes. was very, very different, you know, because in fact, that was the first time I ever did two shows in a day. By the way, Candide two shows is... <laughs> <laughs> like, that's my like diving into the deep end, baby. And like, I remember we had like a dress, we had an orchestra run, a dress rehearsal on the day of our opening, and then a five show oh. weekend. And I, never, I remember my agents even thought it was a mistake. They're like, surely this isn't right. No, it was. And yes. um, I just learned so much. And also what I was so struck by was working alongside um, performers from the Broadway world is their, their just like can-do attitude. And they just dove in. And I felt such a kindred spirit to that. And I'm not saying that our opera people don't do that, but quite frankly, to that degree, I had never seen that before. And it was so inspiring. And like, you had these legends, literally, from like, from the directing side, I mean, Hal Prince himself, Pat Birch, uh, I mean, like all these legends, but like, everyone was so awesome and nice. And I mean, they did expect, I mean, you better take a note and like, quick, right? Yeah. But it was, it was, I, I was living it. Honestly, I was living it. And that just catapulted my career in a completely different, different direction than I had ever really imagined, to be honest. Because I remember in the midst of it, he and Patch Birch, they were like, well, 
kiddo, would you, would you like to, what do you think about Broadway? And I was like, well, honestly, I haven't really thought about it. Like, really? But like, sure. <laughs> that's and, so cool. And here I am. So it's just, it, that, but that's the production indeed that changed my life. Like, yes, because from there, my life. you went yeah. on to Love Never Dies. Love Never Dies. And then Phantom of the Opera. And, and then like, Phantom here we are now. I mean, so it's, 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 it's definitely that pivotal moment. And I think we all have one of those in our career too, that, yeah, I mean, of course I was lucky. I've had some success elsewhere, like singing opera in Europe, et cetera. But like this one, that one production absolutely changed my life. So it will always be right here for me. So. Ah, uh, that's so awesome. That's so awesome to hear. So being Christine Daye on Broadway is kind of a big deal. <laughs> And to be able to say that you are the Christine on Broadway, I mean, that's, that's quite a claim to fame, really. How does it make you feel, like, listening to your history? And, and here, I'm still so surprised by the fact that you said, I wasn't sure if it was something I wanted to do or just keep as a hobby, being a singer. That surprises me because I've heard you sing many times and you're incredible. Um, okay. To now be standing on stage as Christine, I mean, I know at the moment you're not and that, you know, we've got this this worldwide pandemic, which has stopped everybody in their tracks. But tell me about that feeling of, of being Christine and, and is it a dream come true for you? Yeah, you know, so again, it's one of those funny, sometimes you don't even know what your dream is until you're living it. And then you're like, wow, this is literally one of my dreams. And, and but again, Christine, actually it's very operatic quite frankly, because it's the longest running uh, Broadway musical. And so there's such a legacy that goes with it. So for me as an opera singer, it feels very kindred to opera singing, you know, like, yes. like basically like when the crown is passed on to the next soprano and it is, you're part of this family, you're part of this worldwide legacy um, and history, quite frankly. And so for me too, Christine, it's really not just PH family, but family because so in the middle, I mean, obviously it all began with Hal Prince and then he asked me even, this was three, three and a half years ago. Wow. Or somewhere like that. Uh, he was like, have you ever seen Phantom? And I was like, Ooh, no, <laughs> I was like, I'm so embarrassed. I have not, I mean, I saw the movie, but I just never, I was able to get around to seeing it. So he was like, I'm going to get your tickets. And I was like, okay. And so I remember sitting there and I just remember thinking, obviously this is epic I mean it was a Saturday night completely sold out standing ovation and I remember thinking to myself I can't believe it this is 30 years later and it's still like this I've never seen this phenomenon in opera before yeah. and I was just like how how many people it's touched around the world is in it's mind-blowing so anyway so I, I saw it and so for me too to make my Broadway debut with her was really extra special for so many reasons because again like Hal, Hal picked me, groomed me, like mentored me, and like sadly passed literally just about a month before I went into the show, which was really like heartbreaking for me because he was supposed to set me, although I love my director, Seth, he's great. And, but truly, I mean, like all my friends, I already knew them on stage. All the leads were my friends. Um, Kristen Blodgett, who's basically one of my fairy godmothers, she's one of the music directors there. Um, Artie Muzella, he's the one that set me on the world tour. And, and then of course the world tour, that was mostly New York creative. So they came back obviously to set me for Broadway. So it was just this huge family that I knew going in and I couldn't have felt more supported or, um, and this was a cool fact too, because I left the world tour after Tel Aviv in September and my Broadway debut was exactly the same day that they debuted Phantom for the first time ever in Dubai. So it was the same oh, day. Wow. So, There's always yeah. so many coincidences, isn't there? So I see this many. all the time too. It's really, really freaky. It, it's really freaky. And like, and also I have a thing with eight and it was 16. So it was like double eights. <laughs> and I thought, I know it's really like, it was just, and like, of course then Andrew Lloyd Webber, I mean, is such a pivotal force in my career as well because of Love Never Dies. And then of course Phantom and, so it's just, again, like, I can't imagine my life being more perfect in a bow with, like, how everything over the last few years have gone. Because, I mean, I literally, I went from Candide, did a couple shows, and then went straight into Love Never Dies. And then from Love Never Dies, three weeks after we closed, I was on a plane to Manila, like, with the world tour, and then 
four weeks later, I made my Broadway debut. It was just amazing and crazy. And I, I'm really grateful, you know, and um, it really honored. I, it sounds trite, but it's really true. And, and now here we are again, part of a historic cast waiting yeah. to go back. And we will be for the first time, oh gosh, hopefully the only time, you know, uh, we will reopen Phantom for the first time in 30 plus years. That's never happened before. So That's it's amazing. That will be an amazing. amazing feeling for you too. Oh, I dream of this day. Like I can't, and like, we still like, you know, we have Zoom and like, we, we are a family, you know, there's, and like, like yeah. so many of them, some of them have been there before I was born, quite frankly. And oh, wow. <laughs> no, truly, like, there's just so much, like, there's so much love there. And so to have, for the first time ever, yeah, aside from opening night when they opened back back in the 80s, we're going to all come together. And I, I the emotion that that room is going to have for that first rehearsal back is going to be, and then that first show back, because yeah. we are coming back. We just don't know when. <laughs> but, <laughs> we're back, but, but again, it's it's part of history. So it's it's almost as if, like, this was meant to be, that I'm meant to be here with this cast to do, yes. it again. like, so it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty emotional, honestly, thinking about it. It's, and it's very special. Like, it's so special. Yes, it is very special. I think this time for artists has also been one of those pivotal moments in a lot of people's careers. It's like, okay, where am I at? What do I want to achieve for the future? And although it has hit us hard in the arts and, and we were the first to go and we'll be the last to recover and that's why we say to a lot of a lot of our fans and friends around the world, please help support us. Buy our albums, um, buy our merchandise, or you know, buy tickets to any shows that are actually coming up, or donate your ticket if it's postponed or cancelled. The arts has suffered a lot, and especially you guys who are in theatre. That's been one of the biggest biggest issues that we've actually dealt with as a, as a society in the in the art sector. Um, so, talking about that, um, we met because the Melbourne Arts Centre put together a show, which was musically directed by John Foreman, and we met doing a song called "You Raise Me Up" with some other incredible artists, Marina Pryor. Josh Peterman, who plays the Phantom of the Opera in uh, West End. There was Alad Jones from the UK, uh, Mark Vincent, a classical crossover singer from Australia, myself and you. And I know. So, <laughs> there we are all belting our hearts out. And I think it's so funny when you hear, when you see, see the song, which you can see on the Melbourne Arts Centre's page. It, it's all of us just going, ah! <laughs> That's what you get when you get a bunch of divas and devos in one little place. <laughs> so amazing. And so we started writing to each other like pen pals, but cyber pals, as I was saying before in the introduction. Yeah. And we just hit it up. So we've had a few conversations over this time. And you've been kind of moving around the States as well, trying to figure out, okay, where do I have to go? And um, it, was, it was one of those moments where we sort of clicked and thought, okay, what are we going to do? We should be doing a song together, but how are we going to sing a song online, do an ISO collab, but make it meaningful and yeah. not just release free music? Because a lot of artists don't know what they're doing and they're releasing free music, but we don't want it to be the thing that stays after this pandemic's over. We don't want free music all the time because otherwise what's the worth of our craft? Mm. So we decided to do a song for a wonderful foundation called the Redland Foundation. Um, and they raise support and awareness for domestic and family violence. And that was our chosen charity to do a song for. I'll let you talk about the song. Yes, well, and, and indeed, so for all of you who are watching or will be watching, so one thing I think that's so incredible before we actually just talk about the song, if, if I may, what I do think there are some silver linings to this pandemic and it's, it's something like what's happening right now. Uh, we would be so busy in whatever we're doing, whether it's our concert work or being on stage or whatever, that we wouldn't have the time to get to know people and incredible artists all across the world, but this was just meant to be. And so to be able to collaborate and cross pollinate and for a good cause, I think that's something too that, I mean, being an artist, we are a vessel of humanity, you know? I mean, we go 
we provide escape catharsis. We, we provide um, the human condition to all. And we help people every single night, whether it's emotionally, psychologically. So to kind of have that taken away in a live aspect, to be able to do this in this capacity, at least for me, I know is very special because it still feels then like we're, we're making music, we're collaborating, especially with such high level. I was so excited to be like, we have to sing together, which honestly, I'm saying it right now. We have to sing, we have to sing live together. Oh, that like to happen. We have the biggest plans. Time. Everyone who's watching, we're, you know, we, we're going to tour and we're going to go oh. down under and we're going to go around the States and it's going to be happening. The so I, <laughs> it's happening, guys. It's going to happen. But until then, I'm really thrilled to be uh, able to collaborate and pr uh, have such a beautiful song and for such a wonderful cause. Um, indeed, you know, women's rights is something that I feel very strong about, strongly about. And uh, domestic violence, particularly with COVID, is something that very sadly has been on the rise because everyone's at home. Oh, yeah. Things are already extra stressful. Um, you know, it's, it's unprecedented. Our species is going through trauma right now. And so mm -hmm. uh, in order to heal, it, people will turn to music and the arts, honestly. They, really, they already are. They already are. So to be able to collaborate then um, and to benefit and this wonderful organization, we chose to sing uh, You'll Never Walk Alone from Carousel. And I really think that there's something so powerful about two beautiful, strong women singing these lyrics. And it is true that even you're not alone. You know, we are not alone, even though, quite frankly, especially in this time, I know that I felt extremely lonely. But and yet, and yet there's, there's community and I feel it more and more as this pandemic drags on. But um, and, and woman to woman, you know, we are here, like here we are across the world. This is like the beauty of technology. I mean, like yes. we are literally on the opposite sides of the world. And yet we've come together to support this beautiful cause. So that's, I, I was absolutely thrilled to, to sing this beautiful song with you. Yes, and we had the help of my musical director, Graham Press, who lives in Sydney. So we've done like a Sydney, Brisbane. And at the time, where were you when you recorded? <laughs> I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> and there she was. So, <laughs> so you know, it's, it is, it's, it's a worldwide collaboration. Now, I got a few dot points because the Redland Foundation are, of course, the foundation that we're supporting. So if you would like to kindly make a donation and support this cause, you can do so at redlandfoundation.org.au. And you can find that information on our Facebooks and Instagrams because we've posted it there as well. But they've sent me a couple of um, thing, a little dot points about some information about the domestic and family violence in Australia. And I found this really, um, really awful to read. And I just mm. wanted to read this to you, that in a recent study of 15,000 women by the Australian Institute of Criminology, it was shown that in the early stages of COVID, almost one in 10 who were in a relationship had experienced domestic violence and many for the first time. So one in 10 women had experienced domestic violence. This is not okay. And domestic violence is never okay. N not now and not ever, never. No. It's never no. okay. Um, and we have a question, and perhaps this is one you'd like to answer, Megan. It's Andre Andrea Sparks asks, how do you know when enough is enough and you need to take the next step in reporting domestic violence? I mean, I have to say, like, first off, obviously, I am absolutely no expert, but I can tell you whether it's physical or emotional, you, I, there's a deep-seated feeling that you you can feel it and um i think you need when enough is enough it's it's a, first of all any type of physical violence from either or it, it's never okay whether it's the woman to the man the man to the woman or however you identify it is not okay also emotional abuse it's not okay um however like you know i i know that i myself has have been in a, and I'm a very strong woman, I consider myself, I've been in a relationship that was rather most emotionally abusive. And you keep telling yourself, you know, it, it's, you know what, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna change. And luckily, it never escalated. But, um, but you know, and when you have that feeling, you need to act on it, because it's that feeling is correct. That feeling Absolutely. of something is not right, and something is wrong, you need to listen to that no matter how 
manipulative perhaps your partner may be or how much you love the person. I think that's the thing that's actually the most heartbreaking is many yes. times you make excuses for your partner because you say, well, you know what? It was my fault or yes. you know, you're stressed out or no, no excuses. It's just when you feel something, you have to listen to that voice and it is time to move forward, to move out, to however you can safely, because also I know it's more complicated. And again, I'm no expert when it comes to domestic violence, but I do know it's way more complicated than just leaving, you know, particularly if you have children. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's very complicated, but you need to seek help. And there are many wonderful organizations that whether it's um, a signal when you go into a store or a hotline, there are ways and but enough is enough when you feel it. You, that's enough. The moment you even have that thought, that's it. That's, that's enough. It how I think that's that's enough that's yes enough. and so that there are support systems all around the world yeah. um, and of course today we are trying to raise that awareness for the Redland Foundation who distribute the funds that they raise to domestic and family violence support services on the Redlands coast uh, where I live and on Saturday I will be doing a huge fundraiser called Musique en Rouge here in the Redlands and, um, and I believe that we'll be playing our duet at that particular um, event oh. as well. So you will be performing live in Brisbane. <laughs> um, so let's move on from there now. Everybody knows what this song is about and that we've chosen that particular foundation um, to, to raise awareness for. It was the point of our collaboration. We wanted to make it meaningful, more so than just having a bit of fun and putting a song together, which it was, but we wanted to have something a bit deeper than that. Um, now, Megan, I want to ask you a question. We've had a couple of fan questions come in. Okay. This one I found really interesting. And oh my goodness, time is flying. Can you believe, like when, when you're having fun, time flies, doesn't it? It's just one of those oh, yeah. It's so true. There was one time, guys, when, when she was getting ready with her makeup and we were just talking. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm putting on my makeup on. Does that look all right? Does that look good? And I'm in like my pajamas, you know, 15 hours behind. The time difference is so weird too, because for me, it's the 3rd of November and for you, it's still the 2nd. Well, the 3rd is our election day. So that one's very potent for us tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So it's good we did it today. The day good we did it today. The calm before the storm, I guess. Um, so we've got a question from Kimberly McCormick who asks, Will it be too late to start singing lessons when I'm 16 years old? Oh, no, you I, can answer this. I will totally answer this. No, I didn't start then either. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, okay. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's okay. It's okay. You got, look, I mean, hurry slowly, right? Like, you know, but at the same time, when you are bitten by the bug, if you are bitten by the bug to perform, then you go. But don't worry. There's no... I think the biggest thing is there's no rules. Like you could yeah. start at you could start at five, and neither of those guarantee anything. It's hard work, perseverance, passion, thirst. Yes, if you start older, like I did, I had to play catch up, but that also catapulted me because sometimes people that just kind of coast aren't used to doing that. And when the rest of us are like, and then you go. So you know, no, don't worry. Sixteen, you got time. <laughs> we like. 16 years old, you're still a baby. You are a pup. You are a pup. Yes. Are we, are we babe? <laughs> we babe. <laughs> All right, Megan, tell us a couple of funny stories um, from behind the scenes, something that's happened to you that we'll all have a good laugh at. Oh, man. Um, oh, there's, there's so many to pick from. I swear, like, things just, ha they happen. Um, well, okay, here's, like, not, well, it is, I mean, it is ha -ha funny because I didn't die. But here's a fun <laughs> fact. Um, so I am 5'2". I don't know what that is in other. But um, so I am very, speaking of we, I am, I am we. Um, I'm very petite, but powerful, but petite. And so I'm the smallest Christine in history of Oh, wow. Christine. Yes, I am very, I am very small. Uh, <laughs> and therefore, I can fit into places that um, most normal humans cannot <laughs> And so my third show on Broadway, um, so something that's not like the world. So the world tour obviously travels, right? So there are no trap doors or anything because the stage is built on top of whatever stage, wherever theater they're at. Oh, so like, yeah. honestly, the Majestic, honest, being on Broadway is like 
10 times, 15 times harder than the world tour because there's just so many logistics. Like the Majestic is a metal stage. That's number one. Two, like you actually have to climb the ladder and then there's all these trap doors and there's fire. And like, I literally, you're just like, ah! like you're on like a reality show and you're like, and then we run underneath and then we do this. It's crazy. Anyway, so my third show on Broadway, it was, it was a double show day. It was Saturday. I'll, I'll always remember this one. Um, it was in the first layer and the phantom Ben, Ben Crawford, thank God for Ben, grabs my hand and he goes, you know, come, we must return. And Christine and Phantom are supposed to run out. Well, I don't know if it was a timing thing, but the candelabras, the doors didn't close. And like Indiana Jones style, I fell through this wee tiny little hole and Ben caught me, thank God for his reflexes. He caught me right like here. So all of my body was just dangling basically oh, yeah. underneath like to the stage. And so, but I was so focused on like, I need to leave, I need to do this, whatever. Because indeed like the world tour and New York are just different enough where you have to really focus. Otherwise my muscle memory would have done the world tour, right? So I was, I mean, it was definitely like, uh, but I just was like, and we're on to the neck. So I remember that everyone was like, oh. And so in between shows, they turned the lawn and the lights and they, and I was like, oh my gosh, guys, is that what I fell down or almost fell down? And they're like, yes, Megan, you would have died. And I was like, oh, and I was like, Dad, I love you. Thank you for literally saving my life. And um, now the doors stay shut. So there's a fun fact. The doors <laughs> sh stay shut for the first time, for the first time in 30 something years, because I am small enough to fall through them. <laughs> oh my goodness. But so it's funny, happens. isn't it? Like every, t I think every time you do a show though, there's always something that happens, like every show. I mean, look, it's when something's been on, uh, when something's been going for that long, no matter, and like, by the way, I mean, our crew are, everyone is so pro, obviously. I think that goes without saying, but like th things will go wrong. It's live yeah. theater. So if a show's been going on for 30 plus years, yes, it probably will go wrong. Like, it's <laughs> I mean, once in a million, it's going to happen because a million is happening. So, like, yeah. it's possible. So, I mean, there have been <laughs> – I, I do – oh, here's another one for you. So, my Broadway debut. If you ask me how it went, I honestly I, – I'm not quite sure. Like, it was just like, ah! So, uh, but – I so, another difference between the world tour and Broadway is in All I Ask of You, in the world tour, you just go off stage because there's no underbelly to run under, right? Well – on Broadway, you get your hood on, or no, no, you, you change, you quickly, you, you're like, oh my gosh, the painting person, and then you run, and I say, you run, you run in that heavy, beautiful dress, all the way down a very steep, concrete staircase, underneath the entire belly of the theater, you get your hood on, and then you run up another thing of stairs, and then you have to be like, well, I've been there, and like, fine, but the thing is, I had only ever done that once before my Broadway debut. And I was so like, I have to make it, I have to make it, I have to make the timing because like you literally run. I'm not kidding. There's no walking. It's like, <laughs> and then before you know it, it's all I ask of you. So anyway, I was so proud of myself that I made it up the stairs in time. Cause it's like, da, 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 and I, I made it. But what I didn't account for <laughs> was that I literally like, ran so by the time I got back up on stage I was like, <gasps> <gasps> like, it, was like it was totally like method acting because I was like well I've been there and, and I just was I couldn't catch my breath because I had literally like sprinted um and this was in your debut this was my Broadway debut <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah oh, I had so many stories I've been in a situation like yours as well Megan that when you are so out of breath from running and then you're trying to sing, you feel like, what am I doing? And your lungs feel like they're going to explode. Especially in a corset and a 30 pound bustle dress. Yes. Like yes. already you're like, look, my little teeny legs here can only move so fast in this Perfect. thing. Perfect. But yes. But yeah, I you remember do, being um, on tour. I was on tour with Andre and we were somewhere in Germany. I just can't even remember. But if I was in that hall, I'd know exactly which one it was because it's like, I don't even want to remember the city anymore. But we had no speakers in that particular dressing room, so we oh. couldn't hear what was going on oh. at the show. And the dressing room was like super far away. Anyway, usually the stage manager would come and say, you know, five minutes until um, you, you go on or whatever. But it was so far away, we kind of had the agreement that day. It was like, okay, we'll just make our way. But we couldn't hear. So I'm 
busy doing my makeup as I oh. do that page. And suddenly there's a knock at the door and it's like, you've got to go. They're doing the intro. So I'm like running, woo, in the big ball gown, you know, with Andre. I run onto stage and I'm like, have to sing, I could have danced all night. So I'm like, <laughs> bed, bed, I could have put a bed, my head. And I just remember Andre standing there on stage and he's like, what's happening? You're like, I'm <laughs> acting, I'm acting. <laughs> So I have a story about New York. We performed oh. in New York at the Hammerstein Ballroom. Oh, amazing. And yes, a beautiful venue, really beautiful. And that day was one of my girlfriend, Laura Engel. I did an Instagram chat with her a couple of months ago. It was her birthday. And so we all decided, let's go to Central Park because Who's ever been to Central Park? I mean, I'm from Australia. She's from Chile. Everyone else is from Europe. We're like, Central Park. Oh, my gosh. It's like the movies. And so there we are. And we've literally gone and got pizzas in boxes so that we can have a New York slice. Look, we've done the whole New York thing. We went and bought Twister, like games of Twister. And we're like doing games in the sun. And we were just, you know, we were trying to be totally fitting in, even though we I mean, totally you, didn't fit in at no, all. No, but that sounds about right. Like, you did it right. <laughs> you did it right. We did it kind of okay. Anyway, the one thing that we forgot was our sunscreen. Oh. <laughs> so we were all sunburnt, but so badly sunburnt. And I'm totally not an advocate for that. For that. I mean, I even, I, I'm, I'm even a huge supporter of um, a cosmetic brand called Block that blocks all the UV you know, <laughs> every day, even on stage, because on stage we also get UV damage from the lights. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, there we are, we're red, but my dress, and it was the same show, so on I come for, I could have danced all night in a strapless gown, and it's sort of like a coral colour, <laughs> but my skin was the same colour as the dress. <laughs> and so I just remembered singing it and just being, trying to act all normal, you know, and I tried to cover it all up, but I still looked the same. I just looked like one whole coral coloured lobster. <laughs> And I just remember Andre at the bow, we took the bow and I, I held Andre's hand and he, we were bowing. And as we bowed, Andre said to me, nice color. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So I've, since that day, I've never been sunburnt again. It was actually a good lesson about the sun. I just, you know, didn't think about it. And coming from Australia, how silly, but you know, you're in a different country and you think, ah, oh, the sun isn't that bright here. And you know what? It's New York. She'll slap you in the face, but then she'll give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a great time. Nonetheless, it was really fun. I loved touring in the United States of America. I've toured there a number of times extensively. I've spent a lot of time in Tampa and really loved it. I absolutely love your country. Yeah. Um, one day I will do the Route 66. Have you ever done it? No. No, oh. I, well, it's for the best that I don't drive, but I'll be a really fun passenger. I drive. We should do I, it together. And then right, we'll if you like to drive, I'm in. I have no control complex. I love <laughs> to be driven around. I do sleep a lot, and there are bathroom breaks. There'll be many bathroom breaks, but if you're okay with that, I'm in. <laughs> we might need to spend a few months doing this Route 66 if that's the case. <laughs> Oh my goodness, but could you imagine us? I mean, uh, audience who are out there at the moment, what do you think of that idea of us doing the Route 66? I mean, I can imagine escapades? that. I'm not going to lie. Like, I can definitely imagine, like, we're just, like, in a car and, like, we stop and we could, like, sing and, like, oh my gosh, that would actually be really fun. But we don't forget our sunscreen. No, well, I'm Italian, <laughs> so I get very, very dark, actually, so. Wow. But the sunscreen is good. You still need it if you can. Well, Megan, it's been an amazing time talking to you today. Do you have any last parting thoughts for the audience? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, if you're in America, vote tomorrow. This is so important. But second of all, I just, you know, um, yeah, support the arts. You know, we, we need you because I know that um, just help us survive. I think artists are someone's people, truly. We, we create where there's nothing. We love when there's no love. We cross boundaries. I mean, look at what's happening even right here. Um, and so please support your artists, no matter, no matter where you are in the world. And also support each other, you know, spread love, um, spread comfort. We're all, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, 
what you believe in, we're all dealing with this pandemic. And so it's just, if anything, making us realize how human we are, no matter where you are in the world. So please take care of each other, like be kind whenever you can. So absolutely stay safe, stay happy and stay healthy, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today, Megan. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's so good to see you.